Good. Good? Okay. All right. Um, so we're, um, Victor and I are here to talk about um, the last mile. And actually, that's a really fancy uh, uh, title to talk about the work that um, we're doing in the DevOps space and how we're, um, you know, how we're basically moving that effort forward. Um, and Victor is a, um, a group program manager from System Center, and I am Tracy Truon. I'm uh, from uh, Visual Studio. So, can you? I don't think our clicker is working. Yep. Oh, <laughs> be the. So, for the agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about DevOps and why is it? Why is this working now? Like, why is it the time now um, for us to actually really move this this um, effort forward? And then we're going to talk about the challenges that um, that are actually inherently in the systems that we have today. And then Victor and I are going to walk you through um, a demo of our current um, shipping bits for um, the integration of System Center and Visual Studio. And then we'll try and leave some time at the end for uh, Q&A. So one of the things I did is, is I actually, this is a quote that I pulled when um, for our my own team, actually, when we first started talking about DevOps. And we are, my particular development team has been using Agile for quite a while. I think it's, you know, it's just like normal people do that because it makes sense. Um, but, but when we started talking about DevOps, they were like, God dang, what is this thing? What is this thing? And I said, you know, guys, just, just think about it. It's just Agile like the last mile. Like we're just going to keep extending. We we're good at, at removing the friction, you know, now in our development process, and we're just trying to get to the next place so that we can get past operations and then get our code out there. And especially for us now, as we're looking at building services, you know, we inside Microsoft are actually experiencing that um, yeah. that pain as well, which is actually good news for for most of you guys, <laughs> is that when we're experiencing pain, it actually makes us move even faster. Um, so Patrick Dubois said it's just it's not just about the development and operations collaborating, it's getting every silo, every part of the business of the enterprise and the organization collaborating to meet the business goals. And my favorite part about this is the meeting the business goals. It means that we can actually join um, at a place that's common as opposed to each of our agendas and actually really drive to a common goal that makes sense for our business. The next. Now, just for nostalgic sake, I actually also pulled a quote. Um, how many of you guys know, heard Bob Muglia talk about dynamic IT? OK. Um, Sam's laughing because we lived through this many times, many turns of the crank. And we had to go in every month. And Bob would tell us, say, what are you guys doing for dynamic IT? So I pulled this quote out. And um, so it, it was from 2007, which is about the same time that Patrick Dubois, um, you know, put his uh, definition of DevOps on the map and said, with dynamic IT, we're bringing together the capabilities of the core infrastructure and the application and development platforms to help customers build integrated systems that will make IT a stronger partner to the business. So that's actually kind of similar to what Patrick Dubois said, only in Microsoft speak. So I actually just realized when I pulled these quotes yesterday is, is that that's why the Patrick Dubois one makes sense. And this is why none of us ever understood what Bob wanted. <laughs> so, um, so, but Bob did actually have the foresight. And you know, we, we actually have been working on this for quite some time. But it, there is some inherently um, you know, some issues and problems to get through. So we'll go to the next slide. So why now? Um, why is it that although in 2007 that, that we started um, down this path, why is it that it's now um, so important? The, the fact is, is that the business is actually driving it. As, as Patrick Dubois said, is like when the business goals start to, to put the pressure on, then everybody has to start to line up. So there's new, the new technologies enabling value opportunities. I think Etsy is actually a fabulous example. Right, like they, you know, came from, you know, it's a great example of how you can actually start a business on the internet with very low barrier to entry and start to threaten, you know, established businesses. And so these these guys, most businesses are very much aware of that, um, of that, and that they need to keep moving forward. There's also a much more of a desire to touch 
directly to the consumer. And so that actually is starting to drive new implementations and such that, that the business just has to respond. Um, the mobility and devices proliferation, I don't know how many of you guys are seeing that. Like this is the bring your own device to work thing, you know. Um, that is actually putting a tremendous amount of pressure, not only on IT, but operations, trying to keep the system secure and moving forward. Um, cloud computing, the cloud is huge, 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 you know, barrier removing, you know, a lot of the barriers to entry, removing friction in the system so that they can actually scale, expand um, much, much more quickly. And then as I mentioned, there's just the, you know, staying in the game. Like, you know, it's a, it's a race and you got to stay ahead of the race. Um, so these are the press, pressures on the business. Can we go to the next? See? Um, and so how does that become IT's problem? Well, this is sort of how it translates, you know, to IT is their business is the business, right? Is to, to support it. So they've got it, they've got to take the business forward. So they're under that pressure. They're faster time to market. They're basically people are saying, no, 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 it's not okay for you to take months and months and months to deploy. You gotta, we gotta get this out now. Um, and so there is this desire, this continuous value delivery. And at the same time, it's trying to balance agility quality, scale, and compliance all at the same time is delivering. So there's actually you know, a lot of things that are moving against each other in that process. And maximizing the you know, economies of scale, of course, is also another focus and, and pressure that they're seeing. So, oh. <laughs> My clicker's not working very well, sorry. <laughs> OK. So, so those are all the drivers that are that are you know making this really coming to a head in the last year or so. I think from for I don't know how many of you guys have really seen this surge in the last you know year or so in terms of the pressures you're feeling. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the, and the problem is that our systems actually are not you know not quite there yet to support this. And so here are the friction you know the friction that that ends up happening in the. Um, in the system is we have uh, isolated operations tools and workflows. We have users detecting you know, defects in production that, that um, we can't reproduce. And so um, the incidents are hard to debug for us you know, as developers and for operations to even give any useful information to a developer to actually fix. And so it results in, in no actionable feedback. It ends up in this no repro, I can't make this happen um, situation. And so resulting in really long fixed times, which then you know, causes it to take a long time to fix, long deployment cycle times, because now operations says, like, gosh, dang it, this has taken so long for you guys to fix. And now you're supposed to, I'm supposed to trust you that you fixed it. Yeah, that's not happening. So the, the, just it's a self-perpetuating um, cycle. So what can we do to actually, you know, this is what our focus is. How do we remove this type of friction? So we go to the next. The, the, and, and the other part is that this is also a people issue, right? This is, there, this is you know, two different um, focus and two different points of view so that have essentially misaligned goals and priorities, and they each have their own way of viewing the world. In development, the developer's job is to change. <laughs> By definition, they're like changing every day. It's like, gosh, hey, let's just keep pulling. Especially, you know, like now that we're all agile and we're constantly delivering value, you got to be shippable every month, right? So, so there's that's development's perspective. On the other hand, the operations like, no, don't change anything, just leave it, because that's good. Life's good if we don't change things. And then, you know, of course, as a developer, you know, when we see problems, right, we have one hammer. That's to fix code. <laughs> and so, so we have a desire to take that hammer and we want to attach, we want to see the problem, we want to change the code. On the other hand, when you, you know, from an operations perspective, they have several hammers. Actually, neither, none of those hammers are code. It's the, I can recycle the app pool, I can reboot the machine, I can take it out. It's like whatever it takes to make that problem go away. Who cares like whether the code gets fixed as long as I can keep my system up, my um, service up. 
And then there's also even a time frame, like how you know the rate at which developers think of of time and versus operations as well. So even in spite of the fact that we're all you know on shorter cycles, we think more in times. I don't know. Do most of you guys do like three three week, four week sprints? I don't know. What's comp? Yeah, two weeks. Yeah. Even if you go to one week, right? You know, this is is that that a one week time frame versus this guy. And let's say that this person's even like a pretty sucky operations person is going for three nines. That's forty three minutes a month. Like that's just very very different, you know, perspectives. And so so we're you know, you're dealing with that and trying to bring those um, priorities or goals and priorities together. So what's the solution? Um, I think most of you, you know, shared artifacts or you know, every you know, uh, operate or configuration as code is, is pretty important. So we're actually sharing the same artifacts, configuration scripts, and so on. Um, automation, removing friction wherever possible through automation. And, uh, and also coming to a common goal. So a common you know, MTTR and between dev and ops that they're both responsible for and to really fostering the idea that we all go over the finish line together. Um, nobody wins, nobody gets to finish first. We all go together. So what, we, what we're, what let's just, I mean, we're putting money where our mouth is on this. And when we, we're gonna be going through what um, we have done so far, um, and it gives you a hint kind of of the, the investments we're making and where we're going um, in terms of us actually enabling the DevOps um, methodology. So if we're gonna show you some uh, web tests, uh, the shared artifacts in terms of web tests, um, sharing uh, IntelliTrace information and logging information between System Center and Visual Studio. Um, automation, being able to coordinate between our workflows, between build and um, System Center Orchestrator. And then also showing how, how we can foster that communication and gain visibility be both between operations and dev and, and vice versa using um, the TFS connector that, that we've shipped um, last year. So with that, we're gonna shift into into a demo My. that I'm about to show. <laughs> so, and uh, we just, uh, as we are spinning up machines, we are confirming that the demo is actually in the right state, and now it is. So, my name is Victor Muskaiten, and I'll be acting as an ops okay. person. And uh, go step over here. So, let me uh, switch to our demo rig. So what uh, I will be starting with, um, I'll be starting with uh, System Center. How many of you have heard about System Center? Wow. Okay. You didn't how ask many, them how many use it. How many, uh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> how many of you um, uh, actually used it? That's, that's okay. Holy uh, cow. That's, that's the most that's hands great. we've ever seen. That's great. Um, so um, if you look back in uh, 2010, System Center, um, in end of 2010, uh, in reality in uh, System Center 2012, uh, uh, we released, uh, we started moving in towards application management space. We acquired in 2010 a company called Adico. I don't know, have you heard about Adico? Some of you, okay. I know, I remember it was exactly October 5th. I was one of the founders and CTO of that company. So. Um, we, when, when Microsoft acquired uh, AVDs, we started moving towards application ma management, application performance management. And in 2020, we completely integrated that into operations manager uh, product.
Sorry about that. You. Oh, hold on. Just one more technical. Uh, which one is that? This one. Okay. Okay. I will connect to the right rig. Okay, if I can type my password correctly. <laughs> Ooh. Oops. <laughs> now they know. <laughs> Here we go. Whew. So, um, so let me uh, just clear this uh, alert view. Um, so. <coughs> so the point is that this is ops manager view. And ops guys are uh, leave and breathe by looking at the essentially alerts, a uh, problems. And just in a nutshell, what ops manager uh, does, it does four things, just four. I'm Oversimplifying. First, it does the discovery of various components out of the enterprise. So if you have, I don't know, um, uh, applications installed in staging and prod and development, it can discover those pieces. And if your application contains of multiple tiers, it can dis discover all those components. That's number one. Number two, it can collect uh, some perf metrics or, or events from, from your applications, from event log or from custom logs. Number three, it can generate alerts. So very simple, if uh, your CPU is higher than 80%, then generate alerts. More complicated, if you have a custom uh, uh, health state, your uh, failure uh, that you uh, uh, instrumented and uh, uh, through instrumentation wrote into your event log, it can read it and escalate it to operations folks so they know that your application is sick. That's three. And four. Uh, which is kind of important. Uh, if you want to change any configuration, any monitoring config, it can send that configuration to appropriate uh, machines. For example, you probably don't monitor your staging with the same settings as your production. Okay, so you need to be able to uh, essentially manage those configs, and th those are four things that Ops Manager can do for you. Okay, and what we've done in 2012. We basically allowed ops guys to discover your .NET applications out there and configure basic monitoring. The, the, uh, I wouldn't call it basic, but configure the uh, basic health model for that applications. And how would I do that? First, I would go as an ops person. I would go to uh, authoring and uh, we implemented series of uh, uh, wizard where, in this particular case, I can go to, actually, instead of going through the whole wizard, what I can do is I probably can open up uh, a configured Fabricom Fiber wizard. So I can go to, to the wizard, and as a result of this wizard, I can uh, pick which endpoint I want to monitor. So, for example, if I want to add some some endpoints, you see this machine has a bunch of uh, applications components installed. Uh, and as you see, we installed TFS here, Orchestrator, some Microsoft Ops Manager. So it discovered everything that is installed on this machine. Then what I can do is I can pick uh, components that I want to monitor, and I can define what is my, let's say, alerting threshold. Uh, for example, every time then uh, my performance is slower than five seconds, I want to know about it. Or every time when uh, there is an exception, there is a failure, I want to know about it. So as an ops guy, using those high-level kind of uh, terms, I can define health state model for my application. And every time when my application is failing or performing slow, I will be able to collect the data and generate an alerts. So let me show you what does it mean. So here's, um, I don't want to save anything. So here's my Fabricom Fiber applications. As you see that it's, um, it's a typical web app, 
Um, and uh, uh, for the most part, it works. So if I click on customers or on employees or uh, if I click on reports, oops, so reports aren't working, right? This is a typical failure. It's not that my whole server is down, okay, when I have to collect the crash dump. It's a particular feature of an app that is not working. Have you seen those kind of things? Have you experienced those? Okay, I guess it's somewhat relevant, right? Um, so, and these are exactly the, the failures that now System Center Operations Manager can detect. And uh, as an ops person, uh, what I can do is I can go again to my monitoring pane, look at my alerts, and here I go. I have my, I have my alert. Now, if you look, and again, as an ops person, I'm reading this alert that Fabricom Fiber production, which is my production instance, is failing with, wow, null reference exception, object reference not set. That's pretty scary for me, I guess for you too. Uh, and it's pretty tricky to debug. I mean, when object reference not set, I have no clue which objects where it's not set. And as an ops person, I clearly know, even though it's our problem, but uh, Tracy would have to fix it, okay? So what I, what I can do is, I can now escalate it to engineering. So it's now will be sent to uh, operation, uh, to TFS. So what will happen is we establish a sync between, T uh, between ops manager and TFS. So now as an ops person, uh, when I see a problem that have to be addressed by development team, what I can do, I can just escalate it to um, uh, engineering. And that sync will take all the data that we collected and create an alert. And in a second, what you will see, here we go. You see this uh, uh, ticket ID. That's a very fundamental thing because now what we've done, we've connected the alert that uh, we collected from the operations with an artifact uh, from development with a ticket ID. And Tracy later will show you how uh, she would be dealing with those type of problems in, in develop, from development standpoint. But those are not the only issues. I mean, th that's kind of obvious thing. When something isn't working, and we were able to detect that uh, through uh, essentially exception monitoring and collect the call stack and everything that you will see pretty soon. Uh, in some cases, you have a logical problem, right? Um, and those are very hard to debug, usually. For example, if I go back to my application and uh, I go to my uh, customers, this is my customer list, right? And let me try to um, edit Maria. Strange, huh? Antonio, maybe that's a, that's a glitch. Okay, let me, let me do it again. I wanna do Maria. Still Antonio, right? So something isn't, first of all, it's not failing, but it's not, clearly it's not right. And that's tough to debug. So in, those ki in these kind of cases, what you need, you need to actually uh, uh, much deeper tracing of the application. And in order to do that, what, we, uh, what we've established uh, between System Center and Visual Studio, we integrated IntelliTrace uh, debugging. So now what I can do as an ops person, I can go to my uh, uh, tool, Ops Manager, and uh, I can look at all the endpoints that we've discovered. And in this particular case, this is my endpoint, Fabricom Fiber. And what I can do is, I can start IntelliTrace collection. And this is pretty smart. I mean, if you would have, uh, let's say, load balance tiers with 20 uh, uh, nodes, you'd be able to pick which, which uh, uh, node you want to uh, uh, enable IntelliTrace, because in order to enable IntelliTrace, we bounce the, we bounce the process. So um, in this particular case, I'm attaching the IntelliTrace. And um, the next thing I do is, I want to go through the flow again. So I'm going to my customers, right? That, it takes, was sure? That, was that a, a attachment? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, so that's why I said the, one of the value of ops system center ops manager is that 
it has a topology and it can uh, put, config, make some changes to the, the things that are running over there. It was remote attachment, okay? Even though right now, for the demo purposes, everything's running on one rig. So here we go. I have my uh, fabric on fiber back. And again, I'm going to uh, uh, Maria. And I see Antonio. So clearly, it's, it's wrong. So now, I was able to repro uh, issue in uh, my code. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take a snapshot. I want to collect the snapshot. And technically, you can collect multiple snapshots uh, 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 with this uh, if, you want, if you are not sure if you capture the, the problem, OK? Uh, at, at the end, um, after it's done collecting the snapshot, I want to switch back to uh, uh, from the IntelliTrace mode to uh, uh, operations mode. And that's what I'm, I'm doing. So, uh, and let me show you what I, as an ops person, would get. Again, back into active alerts. Here we go, another alert. And that alert uh, basically indicates me that, hey, the snapshot has been collected. And now I can escalate the same way as, as I was escalating the failure, I can escalate this alert essentially the fact that we collected snapshot to the, to the development. Here we go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assign to engineering. And in a second, um, that problem also got transferred to engineering team. So from the ops perspective, I'm done. I was able to A, detect a failure automatically collect all the problems and send it over. And B, I was able to help our developers to collect more data about a particular uh, logical issue, hard to debug issue from production. And I was able to also escalate that problem to uh, Tracy's team, to the development team. And at this point, I'm done for now. So Tracy. All right. Sure. So um, the, uh, that's why, if you notice, the, the way I did it, we switched but back to the, operational the, the monitoring. Question, the question was, sorry, we've got to repeat that. The question oh. was what the impact of IntelliTrace um, is on the, the performance on the production server. So uh, the, the, that, uh, there is an impact, clearly. Because A, we are collecting uh, way more information. Essentially, for every entry point, we're capturing stuff. Um, that's number one. Uh, then the, uh, the impact on the uh, CPU, impact on the uh, size of the snapshot. And that's why what, what I did, if you noticed, I, um, I always turn back into the operational uh, uh, monitoring. Because that impact is uh, uh, under 5%. Okay? So, and therefore, if you noticed, when I was turning on IntelliTrace, there was a list of node I can turn it on for. So if you have 20 servers, you can pick a server that you can take out of rotation using, I don't know, uh, F5, whatever. And um, uh, do your testing on that thing, OK, to collect it. Can you strip that unit out of all that server? Can that be added in as a step? Uh, yes, we have a PowerShell uh, APIs to do scripting. And as a matter of fact, um, We'll be later talking about uh, the automation. So that's, I'll answer in more details a little bit later. Would you grab the same information that like a tester would grab if he was doing some kind of coded UI or something test? Mm -hmm. Watch, watch Tracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. Um, so what, what I now um, have is, is that Victor's given me a call, and he's told me that we have a couple of issues. And he's told me that we have an exception that he found, as well as something that looks like a logic bug. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take a look at that, um, that first um, issue that, that was raised, which is the exception. Um, and I'm going to open that here. And I'm going to close this down. 
Um, and I can see that, that um, there's an exception that's been had. And I can go over to my attachments. And I can see that um, I've got an IntelliTrace log um, from that first exception. So I, I'm going to go ahead and open that. And yes. Um, so it's it's uh, so what I have now is as I can see, and for those of you guys who've already used IntelliTrace, you can see that this is a very you know narrowed down, very um, specific um, IntelliTrace log. So I'm able to see very quickly that I've got a null reference exception, and I can double click on that, and immediately get to, sorry, let's just get this down here. Um, I go right to the, the line of code of where I was having this problem. And so basically what's happened is, is that I've, I've um, got a null customer here, because I made a naive assumption that for every um, employee that they'd have customers assigned to them. And turns out we hired a new person, and they don't have any employees assigned to them. So in this case, I was looking for all the customers associated with an employee, and I didn't handle the null case. Um, and I can actually go up the stack to, to see, in, um, see, in fact, that on my page, that's why my page was failing, is, is I was hitting that null reference exception, and it blew up my page. So in this case, it's a pretty easy you know, and straightforward fix. So I'm going to go back to, um, to the top, and I'm going to stop my uh, stop my debugging session, um, and then I'm going to fix it. So what's that? And I'm going to use code snippets because you guys don't want to watch me type. Next up, the work right here. What's that? OK. So there, there I've, I've fixed that problem. So I'm going to actually go back to my ops issues. And um, I'm going to do what I probably should have done in the first place, which is um, I should have changed. I accepted it. Um, and I have assigned it. And actually, <laughs> we'll just assign it to Steve for now. But you know, Steve doesn't actually fix all his bugs himself. So. Um, so now I've <laughs> fixed fixed it. So it's showing the code, but this is a code that you have on your machine compared to the code that the problem is. <coughs> right. Right. Uh, yes. So how do you synchronize the, the two code? How do you know that oh. you are looking at the right code? It, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a trick here, so uh, which we didn't show. Um, what we have right now we integrate it with symbols, which means that you drop your binaries out there. And those binaries remember where symbols were. Then when Tracy opened up uh, the IntelliTrace on developer machine, which has nothing to do with production, mm -hmm. we went to appropriate version of that symbols that knows which versions of the code uh, 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 to pick? Yep. Okay. So, so that's so, a two-step process. Yep. So Binaries to symbols, that. symbols to code. So does, does that require then always compiling with symbols? Yes. Yes. If you want to be able to do that kind of debugging in production, yeah. it's time to make sure is, you do that. Yeah. Is there any concerns with uh, compiling with symbols? You think? Good. So it's not. Okay. <laughs> okay. So no, but that's that's very important. It will not cause any performance impact because it's not a debug. It's just compiling with symbols. Yep. Okay. And where does the symbol stay stored in the PFF? In symbol server. In symbol server. Yep. The, it's a share. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to move on to the, so that was the simple one. So now I'm going to move on to um, this other uh, bug that Victor found, which is essentially a logic bug, um, and where we ac actually turned on IntelliTrace on high um, so that we could collect a lot more information and figure out what's going on you know, um, with the app and be able to step through it much more um, in much more detail.
So I'm opening up that. Um, and I'm looking, the first thing I see is, is that there's, you know, as you guys probably know, when you look at, at ASP.NET apps, there's a bunch of exceptions. And so I'm going to close that up, and I'm going to go right to um, my web requests. And I know that, that Victor told me in, um, that the customer um, page was the one that had the issue. And so I go ahead and click on that, and I've got all the events that are associated with that page. But I don't really want to look at all of them. Um, I actually want to just start, you know, sort of by process of elimination, I'm going to start going through my, um, through these events and see if I can figure out what was going on. So the first thing I'm going to do, because he told me that, you know, I know that the data was wrong, is I'm going to just look at my ADO.net um, calls here. So I'm going to just pick the, the last one and I'm double click on that. And then again, it starts up my debugging session. And what I see here is, is that I'm you know, in the code here where I'm getting my customer um, list from ca and loading it into cache. So I've, I've clearly fallen through um, this code. And then I build my cache. And then it looks like I actually return um, my cache. And it says, it looks, somebody left a note here, though, saying that they needed to do something here. So it probably this is probably a hint at, at what might be wrong, but it still should be working because it was working in our tests. So I'm going to go, because you know if it works on your box, it works everywhere, right? It works fast. Yes, yeah. Performance is fabulous. Um, and so I'm going to walk back up the stack, though, and take a look because I'm going to, I just want to kind of get a hint of, of what I sent in and what I got back. And so if I look in the locals here, um, you're going to see that I passed in a one and I got back a customer object uh, with an ID of two. Well, it turns out actually that, that um, I was pretty naive when I was doing this and I just assumed that, um, that there'd be a zero based and so that they'd always match up and somehow miraculously it all worked on my box because I loaded up my database that way, um, which never happens, right? No, of course it never happens. Um, so, so that's, you know, basically I, now I've been able to see pretty quickly that what I sent in and what I got back just wasn't what I was <laughs> expecting. So I'm going to go back to, to that um, line of code and I'm going to um, go ahead and fix this correctly because obviously I can't assume that my um, IDs in my database are going to match my collection, um, you know, my collection IDs. So I'm going to stop my session and I'm gonna uh, going to go to my next snippet and I'm gonna go put my link query in here so that this way now I always have a an ID that's matching um, properly so that, that I should fix that bug okay so now I've got um, my bugs fixed so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go, oh, actually, I'm going to go and run my test because Peter just walked in. And if I don't run all my unit tests, then and before I check in, it'll be a problem. Um, so there you go. And I went green. So it means I can check in now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hide that. How many of you guys are using all of our new unit testing? Cool. Um, and hide this. And now I'm going to go and uh, look at my pending changes. And I can see that I've got both of my pending changes here. And I'm going to go and um, ahead and check in. So now I've checked in. Um, and now I'm ready to go ahead and hand, you know, get ready to hand that back to, um, to Victor and let him know that I've, I've um, finished. Is that? Could you build? I mean, no, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to queue a build up. And 
and I can see I've got a build that's in progress and it's going through gated check-in so it's basically going to go through my um, through the system it's going to go and run all the tests the acceptance tests that we have um, that I'm uh, going to need to run in, in addition to my unit tests and then I'm going to um, when it's ready it's going to show up here like it just did um, and so now I have a build that's ready to push right um, and I can push it you know in in you know, in a normal situation, I'd be pushing it to test, and then they'd push it forward and so on, right? But I'm going to actually live dangerously, and I'm going to go ahead and mark it for ready for deployment. Um, and at this point now, I'm uh, ready to, um, I guess I'll to all. Um, now it's, uh, now I've basically handed it back and to, to Victor, and he's going to take it from there. Yeah, so I'll take it from uh, here, but uh, notice that build quality is now changed to release. Magic happened. So let me explain what just happened, because a lot of things, actually. We have right now uh, uh, used a product called Orchestrator. How many of you even heard about Orchestrator? Oh, perfect. So um, as a developer, you, you, you build a lot of uh, deployment artifacts, MSI, uh, web deploy, DAC packs, you name it. But those are just pieces of an end-to-end -end deployment process. Uh, I don't know, um, how many of you are doing manual deployments at 8 a.m. on Saturdays? Oh, so, okay, good. I've been through those. When we were upgrading three call centers in Hawaii, St. Louis, and Hartford, Connecticut, and it usually was starting at 8 a.m. when we had a call, turn off AVR to uh, downtime message, yes, boom, check, next checkpoint at 10, 10 a.m. when we upgrading DB and, and so forth. So it was a very lengthy and, manu and hard process with lots of manual coordination. So if you think about it, um, the orchestrator is a tool that allow you to automate those manual operational processes in an end-to-end uh, uh, orchestrated workflow. So in this case, we significantly simplify the deployment uh, workflow, like to make it really straightforward. So what it does, it basically um, waits for uh, build detail for a particular project. And as soon as it sees that uh, the build in a, a ready to deploy status, it just grabs the build and does the deployment and change the status to release. And that's what happened. The workflow could be way more complicated. It could uh, take a snapshot of existing deployment or back up a ex database and uh, uh, create new VMM uh, uh, forest and uh, service template instance and, and so forth. So it, it can do a lot of things. But for the purpose of this demo, the automation that we build is pretty uh, simple and straightforward. That's, that somewhat answers your question. We have a tool that allows you to do a lot of automation, a lot of scripted automation. Now, um, Sir, yeah. Is this a um, GUI version of build definition? No, uh, that's a good question. So, is it a GUI version of build definition? That's not a GUI version of build definition. This is a another tool um, called System Center Orchestrator that allows you to create um, uh, create, create pretty elaborate uh, uh, workflow. And in this case, uh, this is again very simple workflow. We uh, set co particular parameters to a particular projects. We wait uh, indefinitely uh, to, uh, uh, for a new build in a drop location. And as soon as that build in a particular s quality, we basically uh, send some alerts and we copy files, it's fix copy deployment and so, and so forth. So, um, but that's a different uh, UI. So now, let me as an ops guy, I want to I wanna make sure that uh, whatever was uh, uh, Tracy was fixing is actually fixed. So I'm going to reports. Um, again, I'm, since deployment just happened, we bounced boxes behind the scene. And uh, what I would expect, I would expect to see actually fixed reports right here. So we cross our fingers. We have a hope that Tracy actually fixed it, right? <laughs> it worked, and oh yeah, that's what she told me. Um, and um, we're we're getting there.
Yeah, it's so. <gasps> yes, well, <laughs> it's there. So it actually well, that's fixed. that's only one, though. Hold on, that's one. <laughs> wait, wait. Let me go to customers. And that was a lot trickier problem. Remember, when I was clicking on Maria before, I was getting Antonio, which, which is not what I would expect. I'm clicking on Maria. I'm getting Maria. Thanks, Tracy. OK, so we fixed two things. But that's not all. Remember, our goal is MTTR, right? And this is, this is why MTTR is important. So now I validated that those two things are actually uh, fixed. And uh, Tracy didn't go through the complete process inside uh, for that operational incident inside TFS. But what's important is, remember, when Tracy uh, changed the status inside on TFS side, and what you see for this uh, first problem, it changed here. And that's a very important thing. So right now, we are sharing the same context. This is our problem. And this is the ops view on the same problem. And there is a dev view on the same problem. And we share history. So if I go and I click here and look at the history, I see every, all the changes that have been happening with that either alert or uh, work item. And now, since I validated that it actually fixed, I can close my problem, and it will disappear. OK? And therefore, my, and that's how I uh, uh, basically close the incident, and that's, uh, that's how we calculate our MTTR. So it's our problem to reduce the MTTR. It's not just ops guys. It's not just dev guys. It's both of us working together to address our joint business problem. So let me go back uh, to the demo, to the uh, slides. Are you finishing the web? Yeah, you. <coughs> you could. You could. I mean, could. yeah, you could. You but in this case, I would have to have an email client also open, and I would have to refresh that. No. So uh, the question is, why you have two systems to do deployment? One, to do your gate at check-in, and another, to do the production deployment. So, well, well, so the, in a perfect world, you wouldn't, right? That's, that's, so that's where nirvana, right, is when we get to a place where we're sharing you know, the, the um, workflows and so on. Um, what we're doing now, though, is we're kind of, we're, our philosophy is to go meet you know, our customers where they are. And in fact, as they do have two systems, they have Dev's way of deploying and their definition of they're done, and then you know you've got operations side. So what we're doing here is coordinating those two workflows. So you know the Dev continues and executes on their workflow, and then the operations workflow can pick up, um, you know, from where they left off. So I is that. Yeah. So I, I think going f going forward, it's you know we would like for you know us to have you know I think most people would like to have a system that they're you know with different views on it and being able to actually participate on the same workflow. But yeah, we're in the beginning of this uh, DevOps journey uh, ourselves. See, <laughs> you see most uh, 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 mostly this is Visual Studio uh, logos here. So next time you we do this session, there will be System Center logos there as well. Okay. Um, but let me summarize <laughs> what you've seen uh, so far. Um, from the ops standpoint, we were able to uh, establish an operational monitoring for applications. And uh, we were able to detect abnormal uh, anomalies, essentially failures, uh, performance degradation, and uh, um, collect root cause information about those issues and escalate that root cause information to the development and integrate those workflows, those processes together. So an alert inside Ops Manager uh, was turned into uh, operational issue inside TFS. 
And then on the dev side is is that as a developer, I was given you know actually actionable data. The, the IntelliTrace logs actually had exactly what happened, and I was able to open up Visual Studio and actually go to it. And in the case of the exception, um, I was able to go very in a very targeted way and quickly see what the issue is and not have to wade around in in a lot of data. And in the case of the um, of the uh, the logic error, I was also able for, again, for those of you who've used IntelliTrace, you might know that there was a subtle um, difference here, but I'll call it out, is, is that we actually now um, carry the parameter information and the inside parameters. So when I went back and I looked at the um, return value and then the object, the context of the object, that's actually some new um, new feature functionality that we shipped in the last update. So I'm actually much, much more able to quickly diagnose my problems. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Was that it? <laughs> um, and then I was you know, able to pretty quickly you know, go through my deployment and hand it off to Victor. And at the same time, we're always coordinating, right? We're using, the, through our TFS connector, both of us can see where we're at. Um, with the problem and keep working towards a resolution until we're done. That's, uh, that's a good question. So uh, what you see here is essentially integration, uh, direct integration between uh, System Center and TFS. But uh, uh, we have a uh, server manager. How many of you, uh, service manager, how many of you have heard about System Center service manager? OK. So this is a uh, idle uh, kind of system to, to do your, for example, ticketing. OK. So technically, those alerts, Right now, we showed very streamlined, very kind of uh, um, uh, simplified integration between uh, Ops Manager Alert into TFS work item. Uh, what you could do, you could, uh, and what typically people uh, you do with uh, uh, Service Manager, those alerts that uh, Ops Manager detected that I showed in, in the beginning would be redirected into uh, tickets inside service, service Manager, and the uh, integration would be from the Service Manager to the um, uh, TFS. OK? Yeah. We just simplified the, we short-circuited uh, uh, the demo. What about the situation where there's already a fix available, and we get an alert in from umpteenth time? Is that able oh. to be pushed out automatically, or how does it work? A uh, fix available, and you're so getting? She, she showed us a fix, and it got pushed. But what if the fix is already ready, but we haven't got all of our customers? Oh, in this case, uh, you are kind of on-prem uh, uh, with multiple customers? Yeah, okay. Th then, um, uh, however you do your uh, uh, deployment and upgrade story, you just, uh, for example, Microsoft has Moon, right? So, um, Microsoft Update, right? sorry. Um, uh, how you do that right now? So, most likely, you have a, a customer support site with knowledge base that if you have this, this is what is available. I think that's what you have right now. Mm -hmm. And they're recognizing error signatures. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the support center to intercept it to uh, not get trauma involved and get the fix on it. So does the operation manager, is, uh, can you target endpoints that uh, the operation manager can get fix on? Uh, uh, most likely, that scenario would not be directly supported because the ops manager working with inside the enterprise, with inside the data center. In your scenario, uh, what you are saying, uh, there is a someone else's data center, and most likely the the internet ports are blocked. Everything is blocked. So in this case, that's that's a little bit different scenario. It's not ops manager will not address your software distribution kind of and uh, uh, remote update problem. That's not the goal. So we're, we're, we're at our time, and we are starting to yeah. lose people. So thank you very much for coming. This is, this is as we, uh, Victor said, this is a journey, and we're just getting started. And yes, System Center logo will be up there the next time. <laughs> thank you.